Welcome back to uh, FaceTime with you. Uh, the last couple of days has uh, been very interesting, uh, not only for the state of Utah, but for the nation politically. And uh, here to kind of make sense of the whole thing uh, is Kurt Jowers. He is the director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. You've been a very busy man the last couple of days. We sure appreciate you taking time today. Thanks for being here. Uh, and, and, you know, just uh, Tuesday we had the elections, maybe uh, some of the most historic midterms we've had, at least in my lifetime. Right. Uh, a lot was at stake. What, what was your overall assessment? Uh, did things go as expected? They went as expected. A little bit bigger for Republicans than most projected. It, it just kept building it, um, that Republicans were going to take over more and more. And so this was kind of the natural trend, uh, but certainly kind of at the peak of where people thought it would be. Um, at least 60 House seats at this moment, looking like seven, maybe even eight Senate seats. Um, and a, a, at least 10 or 11 gubernatorial seats at this point with some changes in state legislatures. Um, and that's a huge deal in 2010. Repub uh, Democrats did that to the Republicans on a smaller, smaller level in 2006 and 2008, mm -hmm. but it counts a lot more in 2010 because then you have the power um, to redistrict, to gerrymander, mm -hmm. and both parties do it. But and it's now, the governors of states that actually have the... The so governors and the legislature, right. Yeah. So now that all of these have switched Republican, it will give them a, a big advantage for the next decade. Now, there's a lot of people that talk about the reasons why this happens. I mean, historically, we always see kind of a changeover in the midterm after a new president comes into office. But what do you see as the real reason why there was such a dramatic change this time around? Well, you hit one important point. It's not, it's not all President Obama. It's partly that every president, except for George W. Bush, and that was right after 9-11, so it was a very different circ circumstance, um, has suffered pretty massive midterm uh, defeat. And that's kind of this American, I mean, our country was founded on rebellion against uh, a power that's not close to us and about too much power in one individual. And so I think that's a residual we see every midterm election is this little bit of buyer's remorse and a little bit of we want him in charge, but not all the power. Um, but with that said, Obama does get uh, some of the blame uh, for this defeat. His health care proposal never became popular, uh, and the passion against it has always been about two to one uh, against the power for it. Um, and the economy is miserable. And whether he deserves a little or a lot of that blame, is kind of irrelevant for this point because people vote with their their pocketbook and you know, President Clinton famously said it's the economy stupid and that's what every election is is the first checkpoint if you're if everything's fine then you have the luxury to look at all the other issue, issues but if you've got 10 percent unemployed you're going to have problems as the party in power. Let's look at things locally a little bit uh, there are some interesting things happening in Utah as well Senator Bennett is now gone we've had a we have a new senator for the first time in a long, long time in Mike Lee. Uh, he has come across as, as a Tea Party member, you know, as, as kind of part of that Tea Party movement. Talk about that a little bit. What did you see the Tea Party's effect being, and, and was it as effectual as you thought it would be nationally and, and here in Utah? Uh, the Tea Party had an enormous impact, obviously, in the primaries, um, the Tea Party back candidates really got, initially, like in Texas and a few places, the Tea Party candidates didn't do so well in spite of all the noise and all the media coverage. Um, but then they kind of got on a roll with Rand Paul and then it just started continuing. Mike Lee here in Utah. So Tea Party candidates did very well. The Tea Party grew in importance and power in the Republican Party. Four million new voters voted in the Republican primaries, which is largely attributed to the, uh, to the Tea Party. But now, uh, after the general election, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Certainly it fueled some victories, but it also probably stole the Senate away from the Republicans because in Nevada and Delaware, had they put the more mainstream Republican candidate uh, into that race, the Republican would have certainly won, almost certainly won. Um, so it's a little bit of a mixed bag with, with Tea Partiers. And, and the real question is what happens going forward. I think as a Republican, um, what helped you win? The Tea Party definitely is more positive than negative. Going forward, it's an open question whether that will be true. 
because there's about one third Republicans who do not identify with the Tea Parties. In fact, they're almost embarrassed by them. There's another one third who identify with them but are more Republican than Tea Party, and then the final third is more Tea Party than Republican. They like different potential presidential candidates. They have a different vision for America between these three groups. So everyone kind of glossed over <laughs> the family problems because there was such a dislike of, of President Obama and Nancy Pelosi. But that's gone. Now they have to govern. Now they have to pick a presidential candidate. So it'll be interesting to see how this family harmony in the, in the GOP continues. I think, I think we're going to hear the word politics a lot, too, especially within the Republican Party, uh, as, as they do in the next couple of years, try to decide who it is that's going to be running against President Obama. Let's talk about the Institute a little bit. Uh, it's, it's one of the, the best in the country. Uh, people coming to you all the time for your advice and your expertise. Talk about the uh, uh, Hinckley Institute of Politics a little bit and what you folks are doing here. I love the Hinckley Institute. It was created in 1965, a great man, Robert Hinckley, um, and the Hinckley family has stayed involved with it ever since. So it's, it's one of those great, enduring family University of Utah partnerships um, that, that endures 45 years. And, and now even his great-grandchildren are taking a, a part of it, and so I'm sure we'll get another 45 years of, <laughs> of that. Um, it, it has the, the longest running Washington, D.C. internship program in the country. Um, we do about 320 internships a year, uh, and we're in 35 countries now. That's a new program over the last four, four years. Um, and these are not just kind of going to another country and studying. You're actually working for a, a member of parliament in, in uh, in Great Britain. So it's not just an, a U.S. embassy, so to speak. You're actually working with foreign governments. You're working for foreign governments, including for a, a cabinet member in Jordan, in the Middle East, uh, traveling around with this cabinet member, looking at the refugee problems. Uh, it's the Minister of, of Social Development there, Social Welfare and Development. Um, you know, we're in China, we're in India, uh, working for members of parliament and government officials, working for some NGOs in these countries that work directly with governments. Uh, so just incredible opportunities, and of course, as I mentioned, the D.C. is kind of the flagship. We have students in the, in the White House and with the Republican National Committee. We have them in Senate and House of both parties. So there's a place for every student, and maybe the thing I'm most proud of with, uh, with these internships, and including our local, um, which staffs the Utah Legislature and our governor and mayors, is um, we provide the most funding for our students of any institute in the country. The reason that's important and the reason why we have such a great reputation is because every student is eligible for us. There was a USA Today editorial a couple of years back that said internships are the problem. And it, it, it was actually true for about 80% of the universities in the, in the country where only the powerful, only the wealthy, only the connected can get internships. Who can afford to go to Washington, D.C. for three or four months? And who can get the internship unless your uncles donate a lot of money or your aunt is, you know, the chairman of the California GOP? Right. Uh, but that's not the case here. We have um, guaranteed internships and we give guaranteed money to, to every student who goes, subsidized housing. And so every student who walks in the door who's qualified uh, can serve, and that just keeps our pool really deep and wide. It's part of that hands-on approach to education, not only here, but throughout the entire university. Absolutely. Well, you're a very busy man uh, this week. Do you get any time off at all? Is, is there a bit of a letdown during the lame duck, or do you uh, keep keep on rolling? Well, now you, you start gearing up for the Utah State Legislative Session. Tomorrow we have uh, leadership races, so it, it's going to be real interesting from now until uh, until probably April, and then, then maybe there's a small break. And then it'll take a little time, and we'll be right back here talking about something else, I'm sure. I hope so. Kirk Jarvis, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. He's the director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics here at the University of Utah, and we'll have more FaceTime with you another time. Thanks.